who's my son, who just recently moved away to Michigan last month. And as his mother, I'm still trying to work through all of this. Thank God for the Thanksgiving, the Christmas. It's been a busy time. Y'all pray for me come January, though. That's going to be tough. <laughs> uh, but um, we're so happy for him. He's already doing a good job there in Michigan, already um, went full swing into his youth group, and um, uh, and plus doing some other things, and maybe he can share some of those with you as well. But we'd like to welcome you back to Calvary Grace, Dallas. Well, it was six weeks ago, right? We were partying hard, tears are flying. Cannot believe six weeks. You know, in some respects, it seems like yesterday. And in other respects, it does it seem like six months ago. Um, November the 18th was uh, my final service here as a full-time uh, pastor here with Calvary Grace. But can I tell you what? Uh, you, you can't, you, what do they say? You can... I say this about the South, you can take the boy out of the South, but you can't take the South out of the boy, you know, that sort of thing, or wherever you're from. Well, it works that way with Calvary Grace, and I think Brigham and his brother Chris, who I'm old enough, I actually taught them in my early years. I say taught, I don't know if I was teaching or if I was just being a fool in front of you. Um, I, when I first started as a youth leader here, they were in the youth group. How old am I right now? Like ancient. This is a lot of hair, makeup, and plastic surgery, but hey, I'll take it, man. I'll take it. But that was back in 1999, 2000, when my dad said, Dallas, you're out of college now. You, you know those graphics we put up that says, we need you in ministry? Well, I got that pitched to me. You know how I would pitch it to you during announcements? It's because I'm one of those guys who got it pitched to me, and I said, sure, Dad, I'll do it for a couple months. Or I'll do it here and there. And before I realized it, I was the regular youth leader at Calvary Grace on Wednesdays in this room back here, which is like a cool do-it-all room that we have. Y'all meet back here on Wednesday nights for adults. And I started teaching Brigham, again, teaching in air quotes, uh, Brigham and Chris and my brother Travis, who was here. They're all the same age. Um, I had no clue, zero clue I'd be doing this. 20 plus years later, or whatever it is, 17, 18, 19 years later, where I'd be in full-time ministry. I never, ever, and my parents will tell you this, thought I would do full-time ministry because that's what my dad did, and I loved that my mom and dad did it, but you know, I got to blaze a new trail, and I never, in, a, in my wildest imaginations, imagination, thought I'd be doing it full-time one day, let alone at 42, if you'd have told me at 22, 23, when I started out leading, 23, 24, that I'd be a full-time youth pastor at 42, I'd have said, you're insane. You don't know me, but God knew me, and God has a plan for your life just like he has for my life. And let me tell you something, coming back here six weeks later is a great perspective moment for me. Because I've been following you guys. See, you can't take Calvary Grace out of me. That's who I am. These youth students, I went down uh, earlier during the service. Because Bill and I and the teens used to lead Revive Kids Kids Praise, like every Sunday. And I had to go down there and say, hey. And so Mateo picks me up with his classic bear hug. Classic, man. He can lift me off the ground in like .3 seconds, no matter how big I am. And either him or his brother does that. And just to be around the students, the kids' students and the youth students, that meant the world to me. And uh, then to be up here, here in Brigham, here in you guys, there's been a lot that's gone on in six weeks, has it not, at Calvary Grace? We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk, you're seeing the title graph right there, a new that never gets old. We're going to talk about how that applies to you. I know we're going into the new year, and so we like to have that theme of new, but we're going to maybe discuss it in a way that you uh, haven't really uh, thought about in, in terms of the depth of who you are and also where God's taken your life. We're also having water baptisms today. Can we give eight candidates, can we give them a hand? We're going to give them a hand, but I, I could not be more pumped about being here being here today for water baptism Sunday, there is something amazing about water baptisms. It's not just that we get to see people with wet hair. Like, oh, I didn't know that he or she looked that way with the wet head. That's not what it's just about, okay? This is symbolic, baby. It's symbolic of 
your life of where you are or where you, I'm sorry, where you were and where you currently are as a new life, that word new, new life in Christ. And so we're going to celebrate that today at the end of the service and that we've got candidates from young, we're not going to say old, but young to wise, right? You know, very wise, yeah. We have candidates spanning the spectrum of ages. I cannot wait. You know, it's been uh, six weeks ago tomorrow that we departed La Plata, and I can remember uh, that day like it was yesterday because it literally was very surreal. And for the first, and I know Brigham, you can probably relate to this when you moved to Boston because this is where you're from. I lived here 29 years. 29 years. Take 29 years away from you and you feel naked, all right? It's almost like I walked in that baptistry with like no clothes on. You get what I'm saying? But you don't want that. It's, it's, it's like 29 years and then that's, your identity is changed, or so it seemed. You see, our identity cannot be in really our geographic location, even though there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, I love Southern Maryland. La Plata will always be my home. You guys will always be my family. Um, many of you who are transient, military, government, who've moved through here, you know what I love to see? It's how this has become your home. But one of the great things I've learned just in this move, and some of you who've moved during the time I was here, whether you moved into the youth group or moved into the church because jobs brought you here, family decisions brought you here, uh, or maybe you lived somewhere else in the D.C. area and you made a geographic move down to Southern Maryland, is what you have, find, what you have found is that this becomes your home, not because you say it's your home, but because of the relationships you make. Relationships are so key. You, if you want a, a place to become your home, just start relationalizing. Just start meeting other people. Just start finding out about others, sharing with them. And all of a sudden, it becomes a home because that's how we're made. That's our DNA. And so we're going to get into that a little bit today as far as how to make 2019, how to make our lives starting right now. We don't have to wait till Tuesday when Ryan Seacrest and the gang on TV are counting down the ball in New York City. We don't have to wait till then. We can do it right here, right now, all right? And God is the God of the new. I don't want to get in too far into my message here too soon, but I'm really excited to be here. I can't, Megan is too. Our girls are downstairs. This is us, this church. This is who we are. As I went to uh, Bridgewood Church in Michigan, and um, they, uh, they are a church that's, in some ways, very similar to us. I think our stories, uh, where they were at 15 years ago, has almost like a church that, that formed out of their pastor went there and, and, and several of his friends to start a church that they had purchased, a building that was kind of a rundown building in a way. Not as nice as this building. Church building never does, no longer exists. And so they went there and they decided, uh, we're going to do something new with this church. And now the new building is much bigger, a church that runs, I don't know, 500 or so people. But you know what I find about that church, Bridgewood Church, my, my new church, is that it's not really about how, much, how many people they have. It's about how the people they have are growing, being discipled, are, are getting closer to God. See, that's what it's about. When you, the longer you live this life, numerics are great, but there's something better to life than just how many people you have or how much money you have or how big your ha car or house is or how nice your car is, what year it is, or how great your clothes look. There's something greater than that. And, and that's where our identities are very similar. Calvary Grace is on that same kind of trend, that same metric that I saw, that I, I see in Bridgewood Church. And that's why I think God has moved us there for this time. Some of the things that we do here at Calvary Grace, I realized it was my first week in the office. Wednesday, November 28th, my first official weekday in the office. First Sunday was November 25th. And I get a call, and someone was asking about some ministries that we offer on Wednesday. That, did they offer those ministries on Wednesday at Bridgewood Church? And I, I'm still the new guy, and I'm like, sure, assuming that they do because... You know, we offered it here at Calvary Grace, and then I come to find out those are some of those that, that God had prepared me for there based on some of the things that he had used me to be a key in here. You see, what, you see where we're going? Sometimes we think every place we go is going to be so new and so foreign that, that, um, that I'm not going to be 
prepared for it. I'm not going to be ready for it. And that's not the way God works. He was readying me for there, for there in Michigan in 2018, now 2019, back in 2014, 2015, when I became full-time here. Isn't that cool? So here's what I want to send to you right now. Where you're at in 2018, 2019, God is going to use that for where he's going to take you in 2021, 2022, 2023. You don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. He is preparing you right now. You're in preparatory mode. And then when you get to 2022, 23, 24, he is preparing you then for where he's taking you next. Never think, as long as you live your life in Christ, it's never just boring, complacent. I'm in like a drab moment, and I guess this is a moment that God can't use me. Wrong. That's, that's right there is just schemes of the enemy to keep you from growing. He is using you right now. You need to realize it. He is preparing you for where he's taking you next. That next chapter may be six months from now, maybe six weeks from now. God's preparing you. And I saw that as I was there the first day in the office with what he was going to do. And then as I began to have some meetings with some of the people on our pastoral team, I saw that exactly what he did for me here, where God used me here, is where he's going to continue using me there. Powerful. Powerful. So, on that note, we've been in Michigan five plus weeks. Yes, it is cold. It is cold. People, I knew it when we went. We did not go there for the summer weather in December. That's where you go down to Miami. I was watching the bowl game last night, 75 degrees, 87% humidity down in Miami. You go down to Miami if you want warm temperatures. You're not going to Michigan if you want warm temperatures. First Sunday I'm there, one of the uh, people in the church, great family, they give me a snowblower, Craftsman snowblower. Yeah, it's all wild, but I have no clue how to use it. I, I, I'm like looking at it going, all right. Detroit's no different than D.C. They completely blew the forecast, and they called off school the next day. We got like one inch, but it was a pretty one inch, and I was the only one happy, so happy. We got one inch of snow. I still haven't used the snowblower. It did get a little warmer. When y'all had that 61-degree day here like two weeks ago, it was 31 degrees there, so pray for us. I'm not going to look this pretty that long. I'm going to age under those cold weather temps. Now, it's, but it, you get used to it. We're warm-blooded creatures. Uh, is there a hum going on? Are y'all hearing the hum? Should I change mics or no? Hey, I'll change mics. I don't want it to get too crazy. Um, I don't want that to distract you. No? There we go. We still got the hum? Okay, we still got the hum. Well, you know what? We'll stay with this mic and then see where we go from there. Um, so one of the things that I've realized since I've been there is you, you're warm-blooded. You get used to things. We adjust so great, don't we as humans? But I think we adjust better through Christ. Through Christ, we can do all things. Um, John Joy Christmas this past week. Santa bring you everything you want. Very good. Well, we're, we're in a newer house. Uh, it's, it's new to us. It's not a new house. And on Christmas Eve, we, have, we didn't have a fireplace in our old house here in La Plata. Uh, it's a great house. We just didn't have a fireplace there. We do with the chimney. So Carson, very perceptive Carson, looks at me and her mom and says, so when Santa comes down the chimney, how is he going to move all those logs out of the way so he doesn't make a mess coming into the house? It's a good question, right? And you know what parents say, right? He'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. He'll figure it out. She's looking at me like, really? Because you worry about every little mess that I make. But Santa's got this. I'm like, that's why he's got those black boots on, girl. He's got this. It's a new house because she knew that Santa got into our house in La Plata 
uh, kind of – he either had a hidden key or he pried open the window. But in Michigan, how does that work? And so she's wrapping her brain around all the newness that is Michigan. And I thought as I was in that moment, and I thought as I was uh, thinking about how kids think that, man, we need to have the perception the, the brain, the thinking of a child. Isn't that why Jesus said, come unto me is like the little kids do? There's something about the faith of a child. We're going to talk about that a bit today. You know, one of the things that I can tell you about uh, new that never gets old is we're all in search of something new. We all want something new in life, do we not? We're always in search of something new in our lives. And there was a study recently done. I think it's why Christmas is so powerful in our, in, our, in our culture. For those of us who, quote, believe in Santa, and those on the other end of the spectrum that have no clue, right? Now, uh, parents, you know, you watch the famous Elf movie, and they're like, there's this rumor going around that parents deliver the gifts on Christmas Day. You get what I'm saying? I think we're all in search of something new because we like something new. Their newness is great. There's something about getting a new gift, something about giving some, something away that's new. And I read a study that I wanted to share with you. It's, it's not a Christian study, so it wasn't done by a Christian organization. It's just a, a general study. And it goes like this. A researcher at the University of York recently put together an experiment that tested people's reactions to a, quote, new technology in an adventure game called Don't Starve. The group played two rounds of the game. In the first round, they were told the map used in the game would be chosen by a random generator. For the second round, players were told a new artificial intelligence system selected the map based on the skill level of participants. And after each round, players took surveys. The results were not particularly surprising. Everyone was way more into the fancy, quote, new version and reported different difficulties levels or let me re, uh, repeat that and reported different difficulty levels when they thought they were playing with that new version they were of course ex th exactly the same game the versions never changed they were just told one was new one was not the study was run again in a modified version with new subjects who each played one round and were divided again into groups playing a random level and a, quote, new level. Again, the results showed the bias towards the new. The expectation is that something new must be better than the thing before. That was what they concluded from a psychologist there at Florida State University looking at this survey. Maybe that's why people go with a new iPhone every few years, considering that nobody actually ever seems to demand or express a real need for the new features on the latest phones, you probably get the point. You want a new phone, but maybe you don't always play with the features on a new phone. It's just something about new. Do we not always go after that which is new? We feel like we need it. It's new. It's got to be better, right? Have you been there? Gift time. Santa's coming to town. Parents are giving you gifts. You can't wait to unwrap it because it's new. Isn't it great to give new things away? Isn't it great to surprise someone with a new gift? Let them in on this new item that you have for them? I think that new has always been something that we're after. It's always something that we want. It seems like it's better than what we had before, and in some cases, it can be. But the question is, in other cases, it might not be. And what if you're going after the wrong new? What if the new you keep going after is actually leading you back to the same old outcomes, the same dilemmas in life? We have to sometimes differentiate what is new that's healthy versus what is new that's unhealthy. Look, let's go back to the original sin, Garden of Eden, right? Garden of Eden, first sin. I always trace all of my inadequacies back to Adam and Eve. Think you, Adam and Eve, right? If you didn't have them, maybe we'd be all perfect. But Adam and Eve... What did they do? They ate a chunk, a bite, out of the forbidden fruit because it was new. Mmm, this is a new piece of fruit because they were forbidden to eat from that tree in the Garden of Eden by God. So the first time they took a bite, it was new. We don't have all the details on what they ate before then, but I guarantee you they ate a lot of repeat fruit that was healthy for them. That was not forbidden, but that was forbidden. It was new. So there's good new, there's bad new. Not to get ahead of myself, but the bad new 
will never take you where you want to go. It will always get old. It will lead you back to old mistakes, old habits, old ways of living life. It'll be dressed up as new, but it's really old. It's like the Wizard of Oz, is it not? You realize who's behind the curtain. You know, one of the things that uh, I love about our God is we serve a God of the new. We serve a God of the new. He's not a God that just kind of uh, wants us to go about this life every day plodding along. Can I read you some verses of Scripture? And I love this about, about God. He puts Scriptures that are embedded right into our Bibles. Because it says in John, the Christmas story according to the Gospel of John, is that the Word became flesh. So what we just celebrated was the birth of the new, good new, the new born king that became flesh. So the word of God we have, the hard copy right here, is actually the representation of the birth of Christ. That Christ coming to the world is encompassed in this word that we can read. The word became flesh. I love that. I love how John went about describing it. So let's go into the Word of God. Because if you're not reading the Word of God, that's when your Christian life does not stay new. I'm going to say it again because maybe you didn't hear me. If you're not reading the Word of God, when my life as a pastor gets stale, it's because, guess what? Not in the Word. I'm struggling. I'm not reading its pages. Anyone go through that during Christmas season? Busy time of the year? Are you like me? It's so easy. So easy to stay out of the Word of God. It's so easy, like, I'll get to it, God. I'm talking about the baby Jesus. Does that count? We need to stay in the Word of God. Let's look at a couple of verses of Scripture. We'll put them up on the screen. Isaiah 43, 19. Can we say this together? I do this in youth. I love doing this in our youth ministries. Uh, can we say this, or our youth services? Can we say it together? See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Love that. Isaiah 43, 19. A way in the wilderness. When you think of the wilderness, I think y'all just had a series on that, didn't you? About being in the valley in the wilderness. Wilderness does not exactly evoke fun, excitement. I'm in the wilderness today. It's awesome. When the Israelites were roaming in the wilderness, they weren't exactly throwing parties and blowing streamers and celebrating New on New Year's Eve. That wasn't the atmosphere. But you know, they grew immensely during their wilderness moments. In fact, they never make it to the promised land if they weren't in the wilderness. That's where they grew close to God. That's where they grew. Streams in the wasteland. The word wasteland has a negative connotation, but the word streams is healthy, living. This is what God does. He takes your wasteland, your wilderness, and he makes something new out of it. Can I give you a challenge today? Don't discard. Remember I told you early on about where you're at now is preparatory for where he's taking you later? Do not discard where you're at now, even if it's wilderness, even if it's wasteland. You start discarding it, you're only going to go deeper into the wilderness, deeper into the wasteland. I'm going to say it again. Do not discard it. Don't scoff it off. Don't act like, oh, as soon as this gets uh, through in my life, this ugly season, then I'll be able to experience the joy God has for me. No, you'll never be able to experience the joy until you make it through there with Christ, by your side, growing in Him. If you're not growing in the wilderness and wasteland, you tend to stay there. And you don't get out. You go, well, I don't understand why a, listen to this, a loving God would allow me to go through this. I don't get it. You know, I was just sitting uh, on Thursday. I went and got my hair cut. And one of the things, I I didn't really need one, to be honest with you. But I love my beautician here. She is, like, awesome. I had a great one in Brigham and Chris's aunt, Belinda's sister, and then she moved. And then I had to find another one. And I'm something about the right beautician, and I found one. She actually knew their aunt and sister really well. And so I felt like, okay, there's a kindred ship there. And it's come to find out God brought her along at the right time. I was in need of one. Then I moved to Michigan, and, you know, I think I found a good one, but I've only had one haircut with her, you know? So I don't know that that's enough. To, that's a, sa- a good sampling size. So I told my beautician, I just need to come in and, like, you just do something. Like, shave. It doesn't even need a haircut, but you shave it up, and I'll pay you whatever you want because she's good. But I realized five minutes into that hair appointment, I wasn't in there just to get another haircut. I was in there to talk to a beautician who's going through wilderness. 
wasteland. Because you know what she said to me? We just found out the day or two after Thanksgiving, it was like following Thanksgiving, that our 13-year-old son has cancer. Yeah, I did the same thing. 13-year-old son has cancer. It looked like a cyst on his arm. He's athletic. He's full of life. Full of, he's your typical 13-year-old, plays sports. You would never know it. They weren't sure. They thought it was a cyst. They take him in, get it checked out. The, pedi- the general uh, pediatrician immediately says you need to take him and get an MRI done. This doesn't look right. Doesn't feel right. Sure enough, cancerous. Now think about where you're at right now. Some of you have gone through that and are going through that. But think about right now, you may not be in the wilderness right now. You may not have someone struggling directly in your family. But how would you react to that? All of a sudden, your 13-year-old has got cancer. And they don't know what stage it's in. That's to, come, that's to be determined. But they think it's treatable. But they've also already assured the son and the mom and dad that it's going to be a long road. It's going to be painful. It's muscular cancer. I can't even pronounce the name. She gave me the name. Muscular cancer that can get into the bone marrow. So it it could be potentially fatal, but right now it's treatable. And I realize as I'm talking to her that all of a sudden I thought we were just going to go in and catch up that I needed to represent some hope there. Sometimes we don't have a lot of hope or a lot of great great answers to say in that moment. But what we do have is Christ who does all things new. I am doing a new thing, and it springs up, and I make a way in the wilderness. We don't understand the way. We don't understand how streams happen in the wasteland, but that's God's, that's God's doing. That's what he comes up with. We just have to be obedient to him. Let's read one more verse of Scripture. Let's go to Lamentations chapter 3, 22, 23. Can we read it together? Because of the Lord's great love... We are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Can I embed something into you right now? We need his compassions, or other versions of the Bible say his mercies. Are are you like me? Have you ever messed up, and you know in the middle of It's one thing to know you messed up after you messed up. It's another thing to know you're messing up as you're messing up. You know, like you're just being bullheaded. Like I'm doing something I shouldn't do. I'm watching something I shouldn't watch. I'm doing an activity. I'm saying something out of my mouth I shouldn't say. We just, you know it as you're doing it, but it's like I just gave in to my own like sinful desires, I guess. And don't you love that the God that we serve, his compassions, his mercies are new, not just once a month, Not just, you know, every now and then if you really come hard and do all the sacraments and rituals, they're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. You see, Calvary Grace right now, and I don't know if you realize it, if you're new to the church or you've been coming for years, this is not the same Calvary Grace that it was five years ago when I was hired almost. It's not the same Calvary Grace it was 10 years ago. It's not the same Calvary Grace it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And if it was, that means we aren't growing as a church the way God has commanded us to grow. And so Calvary Grace, this church needs his mercies new every morning because when you're doing change, when you're making transition, when you're going through wilderness, and certainly a lot of people could say, well, you know what? I love where Calvary Grace is at right now. While you may love it, maybe other people are like, this change, these transitions, they're different for me. I've been coming here for many years, and I don't understand why certain changes have to take place. But what you do have to understand is there's a God who loves Calvary Grace. He calls the church his bride. And so I don't know about you, but I love my wife, Megan. I don't want to hurt her, and I'm not even perfect. He is perfect. So if he calls the church his bride, how much more will he take care of the church? And what the church needs to understand is his compassions, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He will not let Calvary Grace down. And I can tell you, now I'm kind of on the outside a little bit looking in. These are exciting times. I thought I knew these were exciting times for Calvary Grace when I was here. From the outside looking in, these are exciting times. I'm hearing about blessings that are, I mean, y'all, this drum set, are you kidding me? This wasn't here when I was here six weeks ago. We got a drummer. You got a couple drummers. You got Brittany back there. You got the praise team across the middle of the uh, platform. This wasn't happening six weeks ago. Some, have you ever been involved in, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I had just gotten back from 
college back in the 90s, and they had this thing called, you'll know this if you're over 40, dial-up internet. Remember this? Where you heard the, uh, you had to dial up on your home phone to get online. Kids, this was back right after the horse and buggy days, all right? So it was like, you know, it's like, it's like a gurgling noise. And then you knew when you were online. Yes. And then all of us had AOL. Did we not? All of us over 40. Bill, you, you and I can amen this. My mom, my dad. We still have an AOL address. They don't even know what AOL is. They're like, AOL? Why do they put those letters together? Um, America Online. And you would hear this, welcome. You remember that? Welcome. Like you had just gotten into the new frontier. And I can remember when my dad, who is a, you know, a tech mogul in his own right, said, you know, we can do this high-speed Internet. And I'm like, what are you doing, Dad? Don't mess it up, man. Don't mess it up. But we're fine. Let's just stay with the dial-up. What are you doing? High-speed Internet? That sounds nuts. That'll never work. I probably sounded like one of the board members for Blockbuster Video in 07 when they wanted to buy net, this little company called Netflix. And they shot it all down. People will always want to go to a store called Blockbuster and rent these thick cases and pop them into their DVD players. Blockbuster doesn't even exist anymore. Netflix I'm not saying every movie on Netflix is healthy. Watch what you're watching. But we're talking about their company. Netflix, for better or worse, is one of the most profitable businesses in America. What happens when you don't change? When you don't experience the new God has for you? And I don't even know if there was any Christians on the Blockbuster or Netflix board. But that's man's greatness. How about God's greatness, which is way beyond man's ability and wisdom? God on his worst day is still eons smarter than Solomon, who was the wisest man on his best day. Man, I want God's new. And if God's new is, means I've got to change a little bit, maybe, maybe the changes here at Calvary Grace are not just for Calvary Grace. Maybe they're for you. I've had to undergo changes, and it wasn't always comfortable, and I'm doing it now. A week and a half into our stay in Michigan, Megan and I, our girls have gone to bed. We looked at each other. And we said, this has really happened. And then our next question is, what are we doing? But we knew deep down what we were doing. Following God's plan. He never forsakes you. He never leaves you. He never lets you down. And then you begin to, I'll be honest with you, I'm so close to a lot of these youth students, many, most of them. They're like my firstborn child. So as I was going, and by the way, if you have to leave for, if you have to get dressed for water baptism, feel free to, to uh, you can go now or between now and the next five minutes. But I remember saying this, I could never get close to you students that weren't from Revive Youth because those are, those are my kids. They are. Love them. But let me tell you something. It's just like parents who have more than one kid. You love the next kid as much as you love the first kid. You just, but they don't replace the next kid. It's a different love. You just expand the love. Love is limitless when it comes from the Lord. You expand. And so as I begin to get embedded at Crave Youth in Bridgewood Church, I could see similarities between those students and these students. And then I realized these students, they need a youth pastor. They haven't had a full-time youth pastor since July. And then just during this Christmas holiday, I've had the opportunity to be the youth pastor to them in a way that I didn't see this soon. Families that are broken during the Christmas season with a, you know, a father saying, I'm out of here. I'm going elsewhere. And he was a prominent dude in the church. And you're like, what? That, that, what? Talking to his sons on the phone over the last couple of days, trying to navigate this. Another girl who wanted to take her life just a few days ago after Christmas magnifies stuff, doesn't it? We've had that here at Calvary Grace. And I go, God, I get it. New is from you. And when it's from you, it never gets old. It never gets old. 
my new gets old. And then come in here today and wrap my arms around these students and talk. I've t- I think I've talked to almost many of you via text, FaceTime, talking to our leaders. One Friday, a few Fridays ago, I talked to Laura's leading the Revive Kids, Bill and Deborah Revive Youth, Sarah doing the administrative things of all of them and having her leadership involved in both going back and forth. And I got to talk to all three of, their par- of those parties on the same Friday and just hear their vision. I loved it. You realize that God's in this, and the God of the new will see us through. Can I tell you, can we wrap it up right here? Can we go to the Christmas story? You see, if we want to experience the God of the new, we must put our full trust and hope in him. We must put our full trust and hope in him. I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 1 and then Matthew 2. You remember when Joseph was set to divorce Mary? They weren't married yet, but in a betrothal type arrangement back in Bible days, you were pretty much married. It was deeper than an engagement. So he would actually have to divorce her even before they got officially married to break it off. And the reason that he was going to do it quietly is because Joseph was a man who followed the law that you can read about in Deuteronomy. He knew all about it. And he knew that If Mary was pregnant before marriage, that was grounds to be stoned. So so in Matthew's account of the Christmas story, Joseph was going to quietly divorce her because she's pregnant. I mean, like, like how does that, how do you make heads or tails out of that? You can't get pregnant before marriage under the law or you could get stoned as a lady. It's disgraceful. They were treated as outcasts in society. We've come a long way since then in good ways and bad ways, but the good way is we're much, we should be merciful. We've all sinned. Have we not? Have we not? We can't just cherry pick, well, this sin and that sin, and this one's worse than the other. But back then, they cherry, that was a huge sin. And Joseph said, I'm going to do it quietly. And then the angel appeared. The angel appeared in Matthew 1, verse 20, in a dream to Joseph. It said, Joseph, son of David, I love how he called him out for his heritage, King David. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Don't you love that? Don't be afraid. Trust me. Trust me, I'm the God of the new. We're doing something new here. We've never brought a Messiah wrapped in skin to to the world. This is new. Trust me. Joseph began to trust. And then once the baby was born, I'm paraphrasing. Many of you know this story. The three wise men or magi came. King Herod, he was known as Herod the Great. He did a lot of great buildings and, and just his, the monstrosity of Herod's kingdom was just mind boggling. In fact, when I was in Israel, if you climb up the mountain Masada, you can see just some of the architecture he would do. And Herod was great in his ability to build things, but he was wicked. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed some, uh, no jokes there. He killed his wife. He killed sons. He killed kids. Anyone who was not going to be in complete uh, and utter, uh, you know, trusting and obedient to Herod, guess what he did? He asked you. And we're just bringing in the kids for baptism. So that's why they're coming in right now. If you can stick with me, this is where we want to land this plane. And this is going to be, you, you, you'll get landed in a way that will really resonate with you. And so, has Herod was scheming to kill the baby Jesus, who was a huge threat because Herod was evil. Remember? In a dream, the Magi get a dream. God said, don't go back the way you came. Herod's evil. Then Herod says, we're going to kill every newborn son, two years old and younger, because we've got to get rid of this Jesus who's come. And what happened to Joseph again? You can see in the next slide, the next graphic. When they had gone, the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in the dream, and he said, get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Trust me, i got a new plan. This may not sound like what it should be, but trust me, it's new to you, but I know what I'm doing. Herod, or I'm sorry, Joseph, Mary, and the boy child, baby Jesus, go to Egypt, mirroring what the Israelites did when they were in captivity in Egypt, not by coincidence. And they were brought out of captivity by Moses. And then after Herod had died, a short time later, again, the angel appeared to 
Joseph in a dream and say, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. They ended up settling in Nazareth. Guys, if God's plan, I'll say it this way, God's plans will always be beyond your own ability because they require his supernatural power to take place. Joseph could have never contrived that plan. Just like the plan for Calvary Grace, no matter how long you've been here, you can't work it out in your power, but God can. All he's requiring you to be is to trust him, be obedient to it, and know that his plans will require our last slide, will require his supernatural power in order for them to come to pass. They will not come to pass in your own power. His new never gets old because it truly is his. His new never gets old for your life. If you're trying something new in your own power to get God's great blessings, it'll always fail. I love self-help in certain areas. And self-help books can be encouraging. I'm an encouraging, enthusiastic guy. But if you're trying to live this life on self-help and what you can do in your own power, it will always come crashing down to an old outcome. Uh, it's something that you maybe, maybe you tried a new way in your own power, but it's going to back to the old destination. You've got to have God's new. God's new is what it requires to make it through transition, wilderness, wasteland. If you try to do it in you, it'll go back to, oh, I'm back here where I was at before, and I tried this other new method. It's God's new. And that's why, in a nutshell, my wife and I said, we got to follow God, and if he's taken us to Michigan, we got to trust his new, just like Mary and Joseph trusted his new plan to go to Egypt. Do you think Egypt was on their radar when they were going down to Bethlehem? Do you really think they thought they would end up in Egypt for a while? I don't think so. I don't even think they wanted to be in Bethlehem, but they had the census. God knew what he was doing the whole time, and I, he knows what he's doing in your life. Don't discard where you're at. Don't discard, can God really take control of my life? He can, and he will, if you'll give it to him. You've got to trust him, and when you trust him with your whole heart, he may take you places at first, you're like, this doesn't make sense. I don't want to do this. But in the end, not even in the end, during the process, you'll be most fulfilled. Calvary Grace is journeying right now. It is journeying. And I want you, I can see this church in four to five years being at a place that many of you in this room right now think are, is impossible because of your obedience to God releasing our family the way you did. The farewell we got six weeks ago blew Megan and I away. The gifts, the good, the notes, just the nice, well-written cards blew us away. And you know what it showed us? We got a church that's trusting God. To release like that, that's incredible. And then you're going to receive blessings. And you know what's happening in the six weeks we've been gone? People are being raised up. We're the ones I've already mentioned in the message, you guys being raised up, to see you come into activities and services and to be plugged in. You're not coming because of a person. You're coming because of the God of the new. That's why you come to church. That's why you live this Christian life. And he's going to give you divine appointments that you couldn't get otherwise. The God of the new never gets old. And if he gets old, it's because you're not serving the God of the new. You're doing it your way and maybe putting a little God ribbit on it. Can we bow our heads? Can we bow our heads? Before we go into baptism, water baptisms today, as Brigham plays something softly, maybe you're here this morning and you say, I can't serve the God of the new or even follow his plans for the new year because I don't even have a relationship with him yet. Like there's... Some, there, there's a disconnect between myself and him. And I just don't know. I just don't know how I'm going to make it to tomorrow or the next day. I, I don't have much hope right now. If that's you, and you say, I, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need a relationship with Christ in order to really go after God's new plans, you know, before you raise that hand, I'll give you a few more seconds to think about it. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. But just because he's the same doesn't mean he's the God of the new. Because he's perfect, he doesn't have to change. When we go after something new, we realize we're our own imperfection and blemishes. And we know we have to go after something that's better. That's why we want something new. 
But God never has to get better because he is perfect. So in that same context in our minds, if you're here today and you go, I need the God of the new in my life. I need a relationship with the God who will never leave me or forsake me to change me, make me new. Could you just raise your hand right now and say, I need that. I need him to take over my life. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you've had a personal relationship before in the past, but you don't have it currently, and you need to rekindle that. That's you. Raise your hand. I need a relationship with the God of the new. Thank you. I need him to do things that are exceedingly and abundantly more than I could ever ask or think about. Thank you. Anyone else? God of the new. I need him. I need him. Lastly, maybe you're here, and you say, I've got a relationship with him but I'm, tr- I'm, I'm struggling to trust him. I'm struggling to be obedient to what he's, he's calling me to do something right here, right now, Dallas. Like there, he's been calling me for the last few weeks to get involved in this ministry at Calvary Grace, to take a step into the water out of my boat, to get me a little uncomfortable because he wants to expand my faith in him. And I'm struggling with that plan. And he's been knocking at my door. The Holy Spirit keeps pounding the door of my heart saying, I need you to do this. I've called you to do this. I know you love me, but I need you to trust me the way Joseph did when he led his family. When he first married Mary, or or stayed with Mary and didn't divorce her quietly, and then when he went to Egypt, and then when he trusted that it was safe enough to go to Galilee, to Nazareth, where Jesus became Jesus of Nazareth. Those were decisions made by Joseph because of his full trust in God. If that's you this morning, and the Lord is pounding on your heart, you're a believer that you need to do something that's uncomfortable, that you need to take a step out of your boat, that you need to trust him because he's got a God of the new plan for you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you something. The God of the new, when he calls you out, while it's uncomfortable to get out of your comfort zone, it'll feel real comfortable once you trust him. In fact, it's like a sweet drug that you cannot describe because you are in complete and an abiding joy with him. You're following after him. I'll give, I'll give one more second. Anyone else? There's a plan that God has for me that I've been bucking, that I've been trying to go my way, and my way leads to dead end. Anyone else? Anyone else? Can we do this? Can you repeat after me? And as you repeat after me this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you not just to say the words because you hear me saying them, but to say the words because they're coming from your heart. Heavenly Father, I need you. I need a personal relationship with you. I call out to you today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Take away my pain. Take away my suffering. Give me new life in you. Allow me to go where you want me to go. May I step out of the boat and trust you. Today is a new day, a new covenant in my life. I'm no longer doing it my way. I'm doing it your way. You're a God of the new that never gets old. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 What a beautiful day.